Okay, how is week, how did week one go? It was hard. It was. I was talking to somebody about that and about how I would change it. Although, I have to say that you all did amazingly on the, um, on the week one quiz. Can I ask a question about it? No. So, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may. I have one that I, I didn't understand, number 15, and forgive me, I don't know the exact question. I was just writing out my work. Mm -hmm. um, okay. My answer was wrong, and okay. <laughs> I don't know why. Right now that first of all, the numbers and the problems are <clears throat> so. Oh, okay. Number 15 doesn't include me in on anything. Also, because it's a completely redone course, um, I haven't, the only time I've ever really spent with the quiz was when I put together the review. So I am happy to look at that with you, but, and it should have given you detailed feedback. So I am happy to look at that with you, but I can't look at it right here. Plus we have someone that was in the hospital that was taking the quiz today and I don't know if they've done it yet. Okay. But yeah, I, no, but I am. I had the same exact question, number 15. Okay. I wonder, I wonder, answer I wasn't on. I was, I'm right there with you. Okay. <laughs> Was that the one that I said you didn't have to do? I can't remember. I know you said we didn't have to do one of them, but I can't remember if that was the one or not. I'll recognize it. No, it's interesting that both of you had the same issue with the same one. I think the one you down. said we didn't have to do was uh, question eight. Well, I know, but it's a different question number for different people. Oh. Um, check question. Then I don't think it was that one because mine was pretty much in order of the quiz review. Oh, My question didn't right. switch up. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, I might have just made an assumption about the way he did it because of the way I did it, because of the way he was supposed to do it. Okay. I just made a note to check. I better write. There were a couple of hundreds on the test, but there were a lot of 96s. So it's possible that there's something wrong with that question. And um, there's also a report that I'll go in and look at. There's a report that I run that shows me like based on um, each question, it shows me like how many people got it right and how many people missed it. And I always look at that with the new test because if because it's the easiest way for me to tell, you know, oh, a whole bunch of people missed this. That means that there's something wrong with the question, not the students, right? Or there was something wrong with what I covered, one or the other. So I always, I always look at that. So I will do that. I'm going to try. I bet that makes it too. I bet that makes it too dark. Well, it makes it too dark for me. Okay, so we'll look at that. Anything else about week one? Um, does that, when we go to the test, it doesn't allow us to review it after submitting it it to. To, to review what, which ones was meant. I tried to do that and it didn't allow me to. <sighs> I'm looking at it, hold on. Because it should be set to give you detailed feedback. But I'm I'm not gonna. Yeah, I try to. No, no, no. I believe you. I believe you. That's okay. I'm hoping to make a job out of this. Oh, because Corey was suggesting to uh, look at it from the grade book. Feedback. Oh yeah, you have to go through the grade book. Yeah, I did go through the grade book, and it still it said. Um... Show feedback after submitting each attempt. Oh, that's why. Detailed feedback. Wait, did that just apply to...
Also apply default settings to existing assignments and students have not yet started in any section of this course. Okay, now it's going to Okay, good. Okay. That shouldn't have been set that way, but I think I think that changing it the way I just did changes it in um, changes it for all of the quizzes. I'll double check them. Okay. Anything else about last week? So, did you look at the announcement about how awesome everybody did? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, if you didn't do as well as you wanted to, um, one of the things we can do is talk through um, what you, how you approach the quiz and we can look at um, how you got your answers and not just, you know, like what you did wrong technically, but what you did wrong maybe with the approach to the quiz. We can look at that too, okay? okay. All right, so we have two huge big concepts this week. What, honey? Okay. So let me, let me share. Can I ask a quick question about the homework? Yes. Um, is it by default that it locks you, lock, it's locked until Monday at midnight or did you prefer it that way? Locked until Monday at midnight? Like for the upcoming week, like I, I had free time on Sunday, so I tried to go in Sunday and just get started and it's locked until Monday at midnight. Oh crap, no, I don't prefer it that way. No, I'll go change all of the due dates. No, I didn't set them up that way. I don't prefer that. I prefer, I mean, most people wouldn't, Yeah, yes and no. Most people wouldn't start early because they can't, right? But if you're able to and you're ready, I'm not, I don't, I don't believe in locking you out of anything. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So change the, change the entry dates, change the dates. I wish you had told me that Sunday, I would have gone in and changed them for you. But like I noticed the quiz is set where it locks you out. I also didn't set it. Somebody got caught because um, they entered it before midnight, right before midnight, and at midnight it shut them out. And I don't, I don't like those settings either. Okay. So I fixed that. Oh, let's start at the beginning of chapter 17. All right, so um, activity-based costing. I'm just going to make sure I'm recording. I am recording. Okay, so activity-based costing. The biggest thing that we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to look at how costs are, um, look at a different thought process for how costs can be apportioned. So remember that we talked about fixed and variable costs, and we talked about um, product and period costs, right? And we talked about cost behavior, like if, if production increases, then fixed costs stay the same, but variable costs increase, right? So we looked at all of those things. So it, with activity-based costing, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some different ways of allocating overhead. But the, the even more important thing in this chapter is, um, is the thought process that goes into analyzing profitability because activity-based costing takes all the costs that we've looked at before, but we divide them up into different buckets. So like before we did one overhead rate and we applied that rate to everything. Activity-based costing says, okay, so there's different rates for different parts of the production process. So Although most companies never actually implemented a full activity-based costing system, the thought process and how you look at costs changes when you know about activity-based costing. So that's, so we're going to look at what to do with overhead. Everything has to do with overhead because direct materials are still direct materials. Direct labor is still direct labor. So most everything that we talk about 
in this chapter is going to have to do with how we allocate overhead. So there's three different ways of looking at overhead. We can do a single plant-wide overhead rate, which is what we did last week. Remember where we did, we got our rate and we said, okay, we're gonna divide it up um, based on units of activity or you know, however we're gonna do it. And then the second thing is that we could do it by department, which we looked at a little bit when we did um, the chapter where we looked at equivalent units, we did it by department. And then the third one, the third option is activity-based costing. And what activity-based costing does that's different is activity-based costing takes the costs and we're going to look at them based on um, each individual activity. So here are some examples. So like with a plant-wide rate, we have one rate. With activity-based, um, you know, like with our, when we looked at overhead before, we said, okay, let's use machine hours or, okay, let's use labor hours or labor dollars. And you're thinking, well, that works for this department, but that doesn't really drive the cost in this other department. So activity-based costing lets us choose other cost drivers for the different departments to get a more accurate representation. All right, so let's, let's look at how we do it. So we are starting out here and we have our overhead costs <clears throat> and we have, so all of our indirect costs go into our overhead costs, that hasn't changed. Then we, now we're gonna allocate it. Instead of using a single plant wide overhead rate, one way we might do it is look at each product and for each product, figure out what drives the cost in this product. So for one, it might be labor hours. For another, it might be machine hours. For another, it might be square footage. And we can use different allocation methods. All right, are we okay in concept? Yes. yes. All right, so now let's just get, now we're just going to get the information down pat, and then we're going to do several different things with it. So we make two types of go-karts. We make standard go-karts, and we make custom go-karts. We're going to make 5,000 units of our standard go-kart, and we're going to make 1,000 units of our custom go-kart. Now, as you would expect, um, it takes more man hours to make the custom go-kart. So we take approximately 15 direct labor hours to make the standard go-kart and approximately 25 labor hours to make the custom go-kart. So we know that we spend 100,000 labor hours, 75,000 on the standard and 25,000 on the custom. We also know that our total overhead costs for indirect labor our total indirect labor cost is 4 million. Our factory utilities are 800,000. So our estimated overhead is 4,800,000. Now the way we did allocations last week is we would have said 4,800,000 divided by what do you want to use? Direct labor hours, you know, or um dollars, either way, you know, it's like, okay, so we're going to get um, five, six is going to go to standard go-karts and one six is going to go to custom go-karts. But we're going to go a little bit deeper this time. All right, so that's, that's the data that we're going to work with. We still have the same concept for a plant-wide overhead rate. Remember, we take our total budgeted overhead costs which would be this $4,800,000 divided by say direct labor hours, which would be 25, which would be 6,000. So if we did that, oh, I had direct labor hours total, right, 100,000. So if we did a plant-wide overhead rate like we did last week, our driver would be $48 per direct labor hour. So overhead would be allocated at $48 per direct labor hour. Now, I know that's still really new because we only did it last week. That's our plant-wide rate. Now we're going to look at what happens if we... Yeah, that's a review. Okay, so now we're going to say if we did it with a plant-wide rate, here's what would have happened. Our standard go-kart, $48 a direct labor hour, takes 15 hours. So we'd allocate $720 um, per go-kart using a standard rate. 
we would allocate $1,200 of overhead per go-kart for our custom go-kart, just based on hours. So now if we looked at the two of them, the new information we have is direct materials is 400 for the standard and 600 for the custom. Direct labor, we already knew, is 350 for the standard and 500 for the custom. Now we've added our factory overhead in. So if I was looking at how much to charge for these or what it takes to be profitable, if I used a plant-wide overhead rate, I'd be thinking, okay, my standard go-kart cost me $1,470 to make and my custom go-kart cost me $2,300 to make. Now, the interesting thing is going to come because when we look at activity-based costing, you'll see that these numbers become significantly different. And the reason that's important is because if you're going to price something, you're going to take your cost into consideration. If you want to know how much profit you're going to make, you have to know how much it costs, right? That's maybe like, you know, like that's what I'm trying to avoid. I want to... So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, this is what happens if we use the standard rate. Now we're going to see, well, what happens if we look at it using an um, activity-based costing rate? So if we looked at it by department, just changing by department, now we have our regular overhead. We have department A and department B. So we're going to over allocate everything according to our department. So let's say that when we're making our go-karts, we have two departments. One is the machining department, so they make all the parts, and one is the assembly department where they put everything together. Now, as you know, we divide labor and parts up, you know, in different proportions. Like, for instance, in the assembly department, most of the parts are already allocated. What we're mostly dealing with in the assembly department is labor because they're putting it all together, right? So these are our two departments, and that's the overhead for each of those two departments. Um, sorry, question. The overhead is the 4.2 million and the 600,000? Exactly. So our total overhead is 4,800,000. If we're going to allocate it by department, now we're gonna have to figure out what do we think the estimate is for each department? Well, so you go to your machining department and you'd figure out that the overhead in that department is about 4,200,000. And you'd go to your assembly department and you'd figure out that the overhead in there is probably about 600,000, which makes sense because you got more parts and everything going into the machining department. Okay, so now we still have both departments making our products. So you have, you know, this product will be made, you know, machining department does this to each product, and then the assembly part, department does other things to each product. And here's what that information looks like. So same number of units. Now we know that now we're looking at the machining department and the assembly department. Before we just looked overall and we looked at how many hours it takes to assemble, to put together the whole go-kart, right? Well, if we separated that out between the machining department and the assembly department, it still costs 15 hours to make the standard go-kart, but we actually spend 10 hours machining the parts and five hours assembling it. And it still takes 25 hours to do the custom go-kart, but we spend 20 machine hours um, making the parts and five hours putting it together. So it takes us just as long to assemble the custom go-kart as it takes us to assemble the standard go-kart. But it takes us significantly longer to machine the parts. So now, if I looked at this, I would say, okay, we spend a total of 700,000 machine hours. That's our cost driver for our machining department. 50 of them go to the standard go-kart and 20 go to the custom go-kart. We spend 30,000 labor hours. The labor hours is going to be our cost driver for the assembly department because that's, what, that's predominantly what we use there. The more work we have, the more labor hours. So now we've got 25,000 of those allocated to the standard and only 5,000 allocated to the custom go-kart. So look at the difference in our numbers. 
still have the same formula, except for we're going to do it for each department with two different cost drivers. So for the machining department, we have the 4,200,000 in overhead and the 70,000 in machine hours. Because in our machining department, the cost driver is machine hours. In the assembly department, we only have 600,000 in overhead and we have 30,000 in direct labor hours. So now we're going to give $60, $60 per machine hour to any overhead for the machining department and $20 to any overhead in the assembly department. And here's what that would look like. So when we do this, now we have, we're gonna allocate to our standard go-kart. If you look at the top line, that's the machining department and the second line is the assembly department. So now what we've done is in the machining department, we're saying for overhead, there's $60 per machine hour, took 10 machine hours, so that's $600. $20 per direct labor hour, took five hours, so that's $100. For the custom go-kart, we have 20 machine hours, so the overhead's gonna be $1,200. And the overhead for the assembly department's gonna be the same as it was for the standard go-kart because they both take five hours to assemble. So when you look at this, the overhead that's getting applied to the standard go-kart versus the overhead that's getting applied to the custom go-kart is completely different than when we didn't look at it by department. Does that make sense? So here we have plant-wide um, overhead rate would be 720, oh wait, this isn't different yet, activity-based costing will be. So $720 per go-kart, and if we use departmental, it's 700. It's, it's reversed for the custom go-kart. The plant-wide overhead rate was 1,200, and the departmental one is 1,300. Okay, this isn't a big deal, but wait till we get to activity-based costing. Okay. I know that's a lot of talking. Do these two make sense so far? Yes. Yes, really? Patrice, Corey? Yes. yes. Guys, are you good? Yes. Okay. okay. I know it's a lot to just follow through. Okay, now we're gonna look at activity-based costing. So for activity-based costing, there's still four steps and they're really not different. There's just more categories. So we have to figure out what activities there are and for those activities, what drives the cost of them. Then we're gonna trace those costs to what's called cost pools. In other words, we wanna put all the similar costs in one bucket. It's kind of like if you were doing a shape sorter. You want to put all the, the related costs in the same buckets. Then you're going to figure out activity rates. So like if this one's driven by labor hours, how many labor hours do we think there's going to be? And then we can apportion our costs. Sounds like a lot when it's just hypothetical. So when we're talking about costs, the interesting thing about activity-based costing is that it goes beyond the costs that we've looked at before. Before, we took out and didn't consider any of the costs that were associated with like general and administrative things. So if I had asked you before last week, is, um, is making sales calls part of the cost of our product or part of the cost of generating revenue, what would you say? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's part of, because if we didn't have salespeople go out, then we wouldn't have sales. What about our customer service department? Would you say that that's part of the cost of generating sales? Yeah, it, it's part of the cost of generating sales. But we didn't take any of that into consideration last week. But with activity-based costing, we do take that into consideration. Now we can look at some of the administrative things and say they cost money. 
We also didn't take into account some of the things like machine downtime when you're um, like, let's say, well, like I live in Detroit, huge example here. Um, the plants, the, the car manufacturers literally shut down for like a month every year to retool for the new models. Well, we didn't take into account those costs. If you were a company that spray painted furniture, every time you change colors, you have to blow out the lines and, and start again. So if you had a customer that had multiple colors, we didn't take that into consideration. This lets us do that. Eventually, this will let us do that. There we go. Okay, so now when we're looking at our costs, we look around at, at our process and we're like, you know, okay, so first of all, we have to set up, you know, we have to set up, set up the machinery. We have to prepare, repair machinery. We have factory maintenance. We have engineers that we pay to develop these go-kart models. We have the power that goes to the assembly line and we have heating and lighting. So when we look at our $4,800,000 in overhead, these are the actual costs that make up that estimate. And what we're going to do now is instead of just lumping it all into one big bucket or dividing it into two buckets, we're going to see if there are maybe more buckets with better cost drivers that we could assign. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, well, where you've got one activity pool is like craftsmanship. One of them is all the setup because we have to set up for both models. One is we have to design. We have to design both models and that's gonna be a very interesting cost. And then there's the plant services, just the electricity and the, the, the maintenance and the, all of that. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna say, these are our four cost pools. So, if we looked at each cost pool, then we would ask ourselves, okay, so for each one of these categories, what drives the cost? Because we, we still need to take our estimated cost divided by our cost driver. So what, what makes the cost? So for the assembly line power, we're gonna say, okay, well, that, that would probably be like direct labor hours because the more, um, people that are assembling, the more hours they spend doing whatever they're doing to build the go-karts, the more assembly line power we utilize. So we can do that by direct labor hours. The setup, we figure it costs $700,000 to set up the um, machine, plus we spend a million three hundred repairing it. So we have two million costs that are related to setting up the machines. Well, Let's divide that up by the number of batches because every time we have to do a new batch, we have to set up. So instead of just throwing that all into one category, let's separate that by batches. So every time we do a batch change, we're going to allocate overhead for that setup. Now the design modifications. Um, we have 10 designs that we do. So we should use the number of designs that are done to divide up those engineer salaries because we're paying one million two hundred thousand dollars for engineers we shouldn't just lump those in directly overhead because what you're going to see is do you think we use substantially more engineering fees for the standard go-kart or for our custom go-karts Which one is going to go to the engineers? Well, think about it. The standard go-kart is going to be the same every single time, right? That's like, hey, yes, we sell go-karts. This is our standard go-kart. You can buy our standard go-kart, or we can create one for you. Now, if you buy the standard go-kart, you spend... I mean, I, I paid the engineers one time to develop that. So that's the standard go-kart. What if you buy the custom go-kart? Customized every time. Every time, every time. That's why I pay engineers $1,200,000 a year. I pay engine, which is not a small amount of money. I pay engineers, I spend $1,200,000 a year on engineers for those 
custom designs that I need to have them create so I can sell to the people, right? Not the standard design. And then we have our plant services, our factory maintenance and our heating and lighting. Well, those aren't really related to direct labor hours. I mean, it doesn't matter how many people I put in the building, that's not gonna change. And they're not really related to batches because it doesn't matter how many batches I do. And they're not really related to machine hours because it doesn't matter how many hours I run the machine, the heating and the lighting and the factory maintenance is all gonna be the same. So really the best allocation method for that is by square foot. Okay, so does, does the information here make sense and how we're switching it up, does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, yes. now what we're gonna do. <clears throat> now we're gonna assign these overhead rates, which really isn't any different than the way we did it before. The difference is we have more groups and different drivers. That's, that's the only difference. We still are going to take our overhead costs, but this time it's gonna be how much of the cost was assigned to that pool divided by our cost driver, which will be either the direct labor hours, the number of batches, the number of um, designs that the engineers have to do or the square feet. So for instance, with our craftsmanship cost pool, that was $600,000 we decided the direct labor hours, that's this one up here, the top one. So $600,000, we decided direct labor hours would be the most reasonable cost driver. So for the overhead for that, we're gonna say 600,000 divided by the 30,000 direct labor hours. So there's our 600,000 divided by the 30,000 direct labor hours. So for craftsmanship, we're going to allocate $20 per direct labor hour. So when we do that for each of these, here's what happens. We get $20 per direct labor hour for craftsmen. We get $10,000 per batch for the setup. We get $120,000 per design for the design modifications and $50 per square foot for the plant services. So we've completely redone the way we're going to apportion our overhead. So let's see what, did, so do these numbers make sense to do how we got these numbers make sense? Okay, so now we're going to use them and you'll see the huge difference. So we allocated each one, you already saw that. All right, so here's what happens. Move us down here. Okay, so here's what happens here. So we've got standard go-karts on the left and regular go-karts on the right. Can I make sense of this? So when I look at this, ah. Activities consumed, activity rate. We're drawing down there. Okay, so when we look at this, here's what we see. We see you clicking helplessly on a pen. All right, so for craftsmanship, for our standard go-karts, they take 25,000 direct labor hours. Compared to our custom go-karts only take 5,000 direct labor hours because there aren't as many, right? It doesn't matter how many there are. There aren't as many. We assign that a rate of $20 per direct labor hours. So now we've allocated costs of $500,000 to our standard go-karts and 100,000 $100, to our custom go-karts. Then for our setup, this gets interesting. So for standard go-karts, we only set up 40 batches a year. At $10,000 per batch, our setup is worth about 400,000 in overhead. Versus our custom go-karts have a setup every single time we're gonna make one. 
So we have 160 batches that we do. At 10,000 per batch means we're gonna assign $1,600,000 to our custom go-karts. Now the designs are just what we were thinking. I don't need any design to do my standard go-kart. It's just our standard, we just, we always make it. So that doesn't cost us anything. All 10 designs were for our custom go-karts. So at 120,000, we're gonna allocate 1,200,000 to our custom go-karts. And then the last thing is our plants. Well, the, um, the standard go-karts, we make more of them. They require more square footage. So based on square footage, we're giving them 600,000. Our custom go-karts don't require as much. So we've got 8,000, so 400,000. The problem is, if you look at this, our big, um, our big money hogs are the, um, the design fee, right? Which I have nothing here, and the batch setup. I mean, those are huge cost differences. So if I allocate overhead this way, what I end up with is $1,500,000 to allocate to my standard go-karts and $3,300,000 to allocate to my custom go-karts. Now, now we need to look at what does that make the cost of each go-kart? Because right now this is just a big, a big number. We have to divide it up by the number of go-karts we make to figure out how much per go-kart is this. Are we good here so far? So this is like our total overhead for each one. So here's the interesting thing. If I'm looking at my overhead per go-kart, now, if I take my standard go-kart, we came up with $1,500,000 in overhead, which is for 5,000 units, $300 per unit. My custom go-kart, however, look at that. My custom go-kart is $3,300 per unit. Do you remember how much it was before? Before, it was $1,300 and $1,200. These, this is what it was before, my custom go-kart. My standard go-kart was seven and 720, so we'll just say seven and 1300. So now when you look here, what we have is, this was, it was around 700, and this was around 1300. huge difference. So when you when you start figuring in things like how much does it cost to reset up batches? How much, you know, what are how are we paying for the engineers? What do we really spend them on? Now you can see I couldn't sell my custom go-kart for $2800. That's where all my money's going. So this is well there we go. This is our comparison. So which one do you think is the most, I'm gonna unmute everyone. Which one do you think is the most accurate and why? Activity based costing. How come? Because it accounts for everything or more things. Okay. It specializes in each one. Okay. You don't think it's overstated? Maybe, but it shows that uh, the customs are costing them a little bit more. Um, so they're probably not making a profit on that one versus the standard. Right. You'd have to be very careful to make a profit on it. Yes. Okay. So here's what here's what's happened in the real world. In the real world, to um, to use activity-based costing fully, you really have to keep a completely separate um, record of your costs, right? Which most companies don't do. However, 
a lot of companies have looked at it and implemented partial activity-based costing. But if nothing else, understanding why this is different and how to do it is important because, for instance, I had a customer that was paying us a lot of money to manufacture cushions. And, you know, we cashed those checks and those checks paid rent and paid payroll. But one day my husband and I sat down and it's like, but are we making money on them? I mean, yes, we're getting cash, but are we making money on them? Because we had to do rework so often because of their furniture differences. They didn't hold their tolerance as well. And we had all of these custom orders. And so when we really looked at it, I realized that we weren't making money and we fired them. So this is important. It's the way you look at it is important. One of the things that you're going to see that I didn't put a lot of detail in here because you can read it is the difference between types of activities. So there's unit level, batch level, product level, and facility level. And what these have to do with when you read about them is that it's like the unit level costs only affect manufacturing that particular unit. Batch level costs affect starting and stopping batches of product. Product level costs affect the entire product group and facility level costs affect you know the entire the entire production the entire production facility all of the manufacturing so let's do i left these here a let's do let's work with this let's put some not hypothetical to this um I am going to pull up an example to do together. <clears throat> oh, not in Blackboard anymore. Catherine, I have a question. Yes. Um, so for so for a business is it mandatory for them to run their overhead cost allocation method in all three different ways and then determine which one's best do they have nope. to run three methods all the time or so why isn't there just a standardized method like why why doesn't all why don't all businesses use activity based costing well first of all it's first of all everything in this course has to do with um finding the best way to put together information for management to make better decisions, right? So there, there is no, there's no requirements, like there is in financial accounting, there's no rules. The reason though that companies don't use activity-based costing is a variety of things. When I went to, when I did graduate school, I got my um, graduate degree in 2000. So 18 years ago, when I took advanced cost accounting, activity-based costing was huge. In fact, the entire course was activity-based costing. And because I remember getting into it and thinking, wait, this isn't what I learned. And, um, and everyone thought, you know, this would be the next best thing. Everybody was going to go to it. But the problem is that you really do have to track costs completely differently. And so the barrier to doing it is greater a lot of the time a full-blown system is greater than the advantages unless you're a large manufacturing company so that's the reason a lot of companies don't do it um, a lot of companies don't even do good management reporting like for figuring to to figure out these answers did i answer your question yes yes you did. <laughs> i'm like as i'm talking it's like did i answer him Yes, no, that was that makes sense. Okay. I think that even when I, I love activity based costing because even if you're not doing it fully, understanding, you know, that like setting up different batches costs money. Understanding that um, invoicing customers costs money. Understanding that hand holding costs money, change orders cost money, and and erode your profitability is important. Oops. 
need to look at this from thank you a standpoint of So, wait, are we going to pull it? Oh, there we go. I'm like, are we going to pull anything up? Okay, so let's start this one together. Because in the next one, we can do separately. So, Textra Plastics produces parts for a variety of small machine manufacturers. Most products go through two operations. Can I write on this? I can't write on this. Two operations, molding and trimming before they're ready for packaging. Expected costs and activities for the modeling department and for the trimming departments are. So we know direct labor hours, machine hours, and overhead costs. It's really important with these problems to really get straight in your head, you know, what the um, information you have, what it tells you. So we know direct labor hours, machine hours, and overhead costs for molding and trimming. We have two special order parts that we want to manufacture. And they tell us how many units, how many machine hours each takes, how many trimming hours each takes, and for direct labor, how much it takes for molding and how much it takes for trimming. We want to first do the plant-wide overhead rate using direct labor hours as the base. So if I'm going to use the plant, if I'm going to do a plant-wide overhead rate, what am I going to take first? What's my formula for my plant-wide overhead rate? Total overhead divided by the labor hours, or the estimated overhead divided by estimated labor hours. Right. <clears throat> okay, so my estimated overhead I forgot the question. We're just doing it for there we go. We're just doing it for plant wide overhead rate directly using direct labor hours as the base, so for the whole thing. Okay, so what is my estimated? overhead costs if i'm doing it for the whole plant 730 plus 590 right i'm going to take the 730,000 plus the 590,000 and i'm going to divide it by my direct labor hours right so i'll take 52,000 plus 48,000 does anybody have a calculator they trust? $13.20. So now, for all my overhead, I'm going to allocate it based on direct labor hour. So we have I think I'm gonna have to go see someone about this concussion. Okay. So when I go down here, I'm gonna say compute the plant wide overhead plant wide overhead rate. So on the top we took estimated overhead costs. How are we putting this in? Oh, divided by estimated direct labor hours. Oh, that is just so precious. Can I, get a I didn't add this together. Uh, 13, 1,320,000. 1,320,000. What was the bottom one? How much? One thousand. Oh yeah, it is. Thirteen dollars and twenty cents. What is this? Oh, per direct labor hour. 
Are we good? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. What? Oh, direct labor costs. See? I was just going to say it's really embarrassing when I get things wrong. And I was thinking two or three times, I need to make sure you understand. Make sure you differentiate between hours and cost. There we go. Okay, that's what we did last week. Now we want to determine the overhead costs assigned to each product line using the plant-wide rate computed in requirement one. Okay, so the plant-wide rate was how much? $13.20? No, yeah. yeah. the answer's not complete. Wait, why? Oh. So... The plant-wide overhead rate was $13.20. Oopsie. I'm confused. Bottom one auto populates. The bottom one auto popul okay. So the activity driver but it said using the plant wide rate. So the activity driver for part A twenty seven C we did direct labor hours is fifty five plus seven, right? Sixty two hundred. Sixty four. Sixty two. Sixty two hundred. And for this one, it was three, four, five, six, fifty, five, six, fifty. Okay, so why is this empty? Because you have to times it. Total overhead cost. It's eighty-one thousand eight forty. Oh, it filled in the bottom one, but not the top. Okay, that's weird. All right, this one should make sense because this is the way we've been doing it. Are we good here? I don't know, last time I checked it, I got it wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> it's embarrassing when I get things wrong. So now, Now what we're going to do is we're going to use a departmental overhead rate for the molding department based on machine hours and a department overhead rate for the trimming department based on direct labor hours. So molding is going to be machine hours and trimming is going to be direct labor hours. So I'm going to put you in a group to try it. Do you remember how to take control and use the room? Let's see. Allow 10 participants into two rooms. Okay, so go to the room where you're joined.
Arturo, are you still here? You need to um, go join the breakout room. The other one that was yeah. just uh, You were just uh, what? I think I was just in that one. Click and go back. Oh, okay. Is there something? Um, okay. What was that? I couldn't hear you. Alexander John Jolani. Hmm. Who's the boggy boy? You have to be quiet. You be quiet. Why are you telling me to be quiet? You boy. You poggy boy. So did you guys all finish? All done. Yes. Um, what did you think? <clears throat> like the last problem. Okay. So it makes sense so far? So far. Okay. Go take a break. We'll come back at like a little about 10 after. I'll bring the, the other ones are almost done in the other group, and then we'll look at the next piece of the problem. Okay, great. All right, I'll see you back in a little bit.
Okay. So does this make sense? Am I on the right one? It's, I think it's the right one. Yeah, departmental overhead. Okay. So how did you get the 30,500? Are my different? For machine hours. Machine hours are way different. <laughs> my numbers are different. Oh, wait, no, they're not. And they're not? Okay, good. Well, the machine hours are given to you for molding and for direct labor. Oh, oh the we're using the ones in the bottom part. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, so that was the only problem. So here you had to do the total for each. You had to do the total for the departments, right? Then you assigned it to the um, actual part. So we said our total overhead costs in um, molding is 730,000 from here. And our total overhead costs in trimming were 590 divided by our direct labor hours of 52,000. No, direct machine hours of, oh, for molding it's machine hours of 30,500 and for trimming it's direct labor of 48,000. So now we have our overhead cost for molding and for trimming. Then you're gonna go assign it to that particular part. Are we good? Yes. Uh -huh. Guys, I love <laughs> that. We got it now. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, go take a break. Come back in like five or six minutes, okay? okay. Oh, can I take a picture? Yeah, I'm going to leave it right here. I'm just going to mute me. Cool.
Hey, Daniel, are you there? Yo, what's up? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so I was looking back on um, the financial accounting class and I was yes. wondering if you wanted to, I'm teaching it next term right after this one. I was wondering if you wanted to like, I'll do them the... Right. Oh. No, I didn't. That's a jeeper. I called Daniel, not Kelton, Daniel. Turn on. Close. Yeah, if anybody could confuse them. <laughs> Daniel, Kelton. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to do Zoom meetings. So I thought maybe to finish that class, maybe you'd like to attend the Zoom meetings and then go do the work in that course. Okay. I thought that might be helpful for you. I, I think that would. I think that would be. Um, because as I was warming up with this material, I was, it, it's kind of, it's, it's bringing yeah. back some of the old, older material, but I think the zoom would be very helpful. Right. And I kind of thought, because I look back and it's like, I don't think you did the week two quiz either. Right. So, it's week two and three. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. So that way you get a refresher. There you go. You could go do the work and it would, it would be perfect. So, okay. uh, if so it's not extra work for you or inconvenient, yes, I would. Be it's not any. It's not because I because I'll do. I'll just do it in Zoom, so it's no extra anything. Right. Right. Just and, that. Okay. Right, and um, I'll just get your your email, so I'll just email you the invite. I think I'll set up a standard course, a standard like number, like based on my phone number. Yeah. Like I think I did that. I just have to figure out how to, how it works. Um, so then you'd always know. But I thought that that would be helpful for you. Yes, that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So both groups finished this piece. So now what you have coming up is going to be allocating it based on activity-based costing, which um, we're going to talk about other things and then if we have time we'll go back and work this but it's kind of the same it's just more where you have like overhead and machine hours overhead costs and the welding overhead costs and the number of purchase orders so you're going to go through and do it by activity based costing so what i'm going to do is i'm going to pull up Chapter 18, we're not gonna go over all of chapter 18, or maybe we will and then we'll just work through problems. Uh, get my head working here. Remember how to share my screen. <laughs> okay, so chapter 18 is like the most amazing part of managerial accounting. Because what chapter 18 talks about is what's called cost, volume, profit analysis. And what you're going to learn here is you're going to learn a different way of putting together the income statement. We're going to separate costs by fixed and variable. And we won't get into until next week, until Thursday, all of the benefits of this. But what you can use this for is to figure out um, can I accept that special order? How much do I have to charge for it to be profitable? What is my break even point? How much, um, how many units do I have to produce if I want to make an additional $30,000 in profit? Should I replace the, if I'm manufacturing those go-karts, if I spent more money on this more expensive pedal, am I going to get my money back? Can I, can I charge more for it? Will it make me more profitable? If I increase advertising and I think that that'll sell, you know, X number more units, is it going to be profitable? Should I stop processing right now or should I process further? Like if you take dairy products, the milk comes out of the cow, do we want to just sell milk or do we want to make, you know, cottage cheese? Do we want to make you know, um, cheddar cheese? Do we want to make aged cheese? Do we want to um, sell the wood finished or unfinished? 
you know, does it make sense to process it further? Will I make enough money to make up the difference? So those are some of the examples of what we can do with cost volume profit analysis. The, the other thing that it lets us do is it lets us make, um, I, I can show you, it's kind of like, I think it's kind of like magic. It can show, I can show you how to use a very basic formula to make bigger decisions where you're not really thinking that you are, um, where it's not really like you're, you don't have to write anything down. You can sit in a meeting and it looks like you just know this stuff when it's not that you really just know it all it's that you can break the numbers down into pieces where you can easily um, analyze data all right so there are some so we've looked at at fixed and variable costs so one of the things that we're going to figure out here is to, before we even leave tonight is like what is our break even break even is when we've met all of our costs We've earned enough revenue to pay all of our expenses. Um, how much we could ask questions like, can I increase income if I install a new machine? And because I installed this new machine, I don't have as much labor expense. We can use what we're gonna learn here to answer that. Um, if my selling price goes down, what happens to my sales volume? What should my sales mix? How can I maximize my sales mix? These are all um, questions that we can answer with this. Now, remember when we talked about variable costs, variable costs go up on an incline like this, right? Because each additional product we go up in, in, in cost. And fixed cost looks like this, right? Because it stays the same no matter what, how much we uh, manufacture. So, Everything that we're going to learn here is true within what's called a relevant range. And the reason relevant range is important is because if I said um, rent is a fixed cost, okay, we, we all understand why rent is a fixed cost, but what if I continued producing more and more product? At some point, rent isn't a fixed cost because at some point you're gonna come to me and you're gonna say, I need a bigger, I need a bigger manufacturing facility, right? So at that point, rent's going to go up. So when we talk about within the relevant range, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about where, you know, we haven't manufactured so much more that we have to move into another facility or, you know, that one of those, you know, we have to open a different division. So those big things stay the same within this relevant range. So all of our, all of our analysis here is done within that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at, and you have to do a scatter diagram. And on the test, you have to know how to do high low. You do not have to use regression. And I took the slides out here. And the reason you don't have to use regression is regression is a statistical model that you actually need a computer for. I mean, not that we aren't using computers, but it's not the point here. You don't need it here. So when we're looking at costs, there are several ways of figuring out where, what behavior we expect from the cost as we increase production or decrease production. Two of the methods are a scatter diagram and a high-low method. So if we looked at a scatter diagram, this is what it looks like. So the, the green dots would be the scatter diagram. So what we have here is we're saying, okay, so it just look at the graph. We have our volume and our cost, right? So what we've done is we've taken this data, like we know if we sold 18,000 units, it would, um, we would, it would cost us, you know, like $16,000. So we put a dot there. We know that if we sold 30,000 units, it would cost us $24,000. So we put a dot there. Does that make sense? Does what you're looking at make sense? So we just simply plotted what we know has happened with the green dots. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so then what we did was we put in what's called a trend line and the pink line is the trend line. 
And what that does for us is we can see outliers, like where it says March, that was, that was clearly an outlier. It, does, it didn't fall within the normal parameters for whatever reason. But the trend line gives us a way of estimating. Now I could say, well, if I sold 80,000 units, what do you think the cost would be? And before you'd say, well, we never sold 80,000 units. How do I know what the cost is? And now you could say, well, based on all of the other costs and sales, I would say if we sold 80,000 units, our cost would be about $33,000. Does that make sense? So that's how we use a scatter diagram to make estimates. There's another method called the high-low method. And the high-low method is really cool because you can separate out variable and fixed costs using this method without even knowing them ahead of time. Like what I have here is I have the units that I produced each month and how much my costs were each month. So if I'm going to use the high-low method, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the highest units produced and the lowest units produced. So I'm gonna say, okay, here's my highest volume, which was in November, and this was my lowest volume in June. My highest volume cost me $31,000, and my lowest volume month cost me $18,500. So there was a $50,000 difference in my number of units and a $12,000 difference in my cost between my highest month and my lowest month. Now, what I can do with that is I can say, okay, I'm going to take the change in cost. Am I giving you a headache, Latrice? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh God. <laughs> now I'm trying to just follow along. Okay. I'm going to take the change in cost and divide it by the change in unit. So the change in cost is 12,500 and the change in unit is 50,000. So that's 25 cents per unit. Now, the magic comes in what I can do with that 25 cents per unit. So my total cost is always my fixed plus my variable cost, right? Do you agree with that? Total cost is always fixed plus variable. All right, so my variable, my fixed cost is just one number, $1 amount. My variable cost is going to be 25 cents per unit times however many units. So if my total costs were 31,000, like they were with my highest volume, and I don't know my fixed cost, my variable cost is 25 cents per unit times 67,500 units. So my variable cost is $16,875. So that's what I can figure out by using the high-low method. So if my total cost is 31,000 and my variable cost is 16,875, then my fixed cost has to be 14,125. Now, let's see out of curiosity if it works. So out of curiosity, I'm going to say, I'll just, oh wait, I can move you back over here. I'm going to say, so from my lowest level, right, I had $18,500 in cost. equals if we use our fifth if this is our fixed cost it would be true for either one plus 25 cents times the number of units 17,500 so let's see Seventeen thousand five hundred times 0.25 is 4375 so now I have, this is four, three, seven, five. So that 
plus 14125 equals 18,500. So we use this difference to figure out our variable cost per unit. That's how the high-low method works. Are we good? Uh, the 14,125 plus the 4,375, mm -hmm. that amount is what equals the total cost, but that other, that's the variable, the 14,125 plus yeah, the Oh, this is fixed. So this is fixed cost. Fixed, okay. And this is variable cost. Got it. So just like we did this formula here, right, to figure mm -hmm. out our fixed cost. So just to check it, to show you, okay, so we looked at it with these units, right? So just to show you that that fixed cost really works no matter how many units, we used it for this. I could actually go back. We could actually go back. So I have 14,125 and we have 25 cents a unit. We could actually go back here. And back here, I could say, let's just take April. Did we do April? No. So for April, our total cost is 21,500. We know that our fixed cost, we're gonna assume is 14,125. And our variable cost is 0.25 times 35,000 units. Which equals Eight thousand seven hundred and fifty. So now, if I said twenty one thousand five hundred should equal fourteen thousand one twenty five plus eight thousand seven hundred and fifty because this is our fixed cost, this is our variable cost. Uh-oh. What did I do wrong? 21,500, 35,000. 35,000 times 0.25, 8750, 14125, 21500. It should work for any of them. I did something stupid. I have to go back and figure out what stupid thing I did. Let's try another one. Let's take 52,500 and 28,500. Maybe I didn't read the number right. So we know that our fixed cost is 14,125 and our variable cost is 0.25 times the number of units Point two five times five two five zero zero so if I add one four one two five plus one three one two five I get twenty seven thousand two hundred two what am I doing wrong? Okay, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <clears throat> We're just gonna go back here before I look like an idiot. So the high low method lets you separate out your variable cost. And if you can separate out your variable cost, then you can figure out what your fixed cost is.
now I have to go back and figure out what I did wrong. <clears throat> okay, but both of these are estimation techniques. This one is used because if you use the high-low method and you can figure out what your fixed cost is, once you know your fixed cost, then you can figure out your total cost because your fixed cost doesn't change. What changes is your volume. So when you're looking here and you're saying, well, what happens, you know, our highest month was 67,500. What happens if, you know, next um, October or, no, or what happens if next November it's 70,000? How much is that going to cost us? Because if we expect the units produced to go up and the cost to go up, then we can figure out, we can budget, we can plan and figure out what we can sell them for. Okay, when we do this, we're, we're going to look at how to build what's called a contribution margin income statement. And this is what is magic. So the difference between, remember our traditional income statement, we had sales revenue minus all of our expenses, right? Or if we had manufacturing, we had sales revenue minus cost of goods sold, um, gives us gross profit minus all of our expenses. But we didn't separate out fixed and variable costs ever. Now, everything we do is going to separate out fixed and variable costs. So what the contribution margin is, is we take our selling price minus our variable cost gives us our contribution margin. So then what happens is our full, our full income statement, the net income would be the same as what's on our regular income statement. But we're going to take sales minus variable cost gives us our contribution margin minus fixed cost. I mean, yes, minus fixed cost gives us our net income. The benefit of this, other than all the magic things it can tell us, is that once our fixed costs are met, this is profit. So if we've made enough to already cover our fixed costs, then our contribution margin is profit. Okay, this chapter is one of those chapters where you would do really well um, to not just use the book, but to take a sheet of paper and write down the formulas that you're going to use. Because we're going to talk about a couple of different ways of doing break even calculations. And so when you have to work them on the test, you have to differentiate between how to calculate break even by units, like how many units do I have to produce to break even versus um, how many dollars, how much, how many dollars do I have to sell? What are, what does my dollars and sales need to be to break even? Okay, so the first thing is our contribution margin. So that's the first formula you should have. Your contribution margin is your selling price minus your variable costs. Now, we can calculate contribution margin a couple of ways. One is we can do it by unit. So like this would probably be, this is per unit. We can do it per unit. We can also do it in total, you know, like the selling price for the department or the selling price for the comp, the sales for the company, right? This is another formula, our contribution margin ratio. So what our contribution margin ratio is, is what percentage of each sales dollar is profit? Or what percentage of each sales dollar do you get to put in your pocket? So here we're gonna say, okay, our contribution margin per unit is $30. Can't seem to do my calculator. Okay, is $30 divided by 100. I just used a calculator for that. Oh my God, I'm an idiot. So 30% of every dollar in sales goes into my pocket. 
or for every dollar in sales, I'm going to keep 30%. So for every dollar, I keep three cents, 30 cents. Okay, that's what this contribution margin tells me. So we have my contribution margin, and then you have the contribution margin ratio. So based on this contribution margin ratio, if we sold $1,000, what's my profit after fixed costs are paid? Three hundred. Okay. So far, so good, because we're going to use these numbers now. All right, so now we're going to look at how do we use these numbers to compute break even. So break even is when sales equal my cost. So break even is going to be um, sales equals fixed cost plus variable cost is going to be break even, right? I have no profit. There's no profit. However, I've met all of my expenses. Okay, this is what you need to understand and keep track of. So there's two different formulas. One of them is per unit, and the other one is in dollars. The units are going to be divided by the contribution margin per unit. The dollars are going to be divided by the contribution margin ratio. So if I wanted to know, I already knew that my contribution margin is $30, right? So let's say my fixed costs are $24,000. If my fixed costs are $24,000 and my contribution margin is $30, I have to manufacture or sell, I have to sell 800 units per month to break even. If I wanted to know what my dollars in sales have to be, then I would take my fixed cost and I would divide it by my contribution margin ratio. So now I know that to break even, I have to sell $80,000 worth of sales. So the two things that you have to know about these formulas is for the break even in units, divide by the contribution margin per unit. For the break even in dollars, divide by the contribution margin ratio. Okay, does break, does what break even, does break even make sense? And do the two formulas make sense? Yes. So this is what a contribution margin statement would look like if we were breaking even. So remember we said, okay, for break even was 800 units, right? And we already knew our selling price was $100 each. So if we sold 800 units at $100 each, our sales are 80,000. Our variable costs, 800 units, we knew our variable costs were $70 each. So our variable costs are 56,000. Our contribution margin is 24,000. We can do that by subtracting or we can check it because if it's $30 times 800 units, that's 24,000. That means that our fixed costs are 24,000 if this is a break even because break even means there's no profit or loss. So now we figured out what our fixed costs are. Because when we did this, our fixed costs are on top. So what this tells us is our contribution margin, after the fixed costs are satisfied, everything else that goes into the contribution margin is profit. So any additional dollars here is profit. Okay, so there's break even. Good so far? So what we're going to do now is we're going to go work a problem.
Well, that is if I go to the correct place. So, well, that was weird. Oh, this is Hilo and Scatterplot. Okay, let's, I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms and let's work on question six because you're gonna calculate the um, sales, variable costs, contribution margin, fixed cost, and then you'll calculate the ratio and the break even. Okay, so work on question six. I'm gonna set up breakout rooms. Oh, you still have your breakout rooms. They're not even anymore. Okay, so go ahead and join. David, why are you unassigned? I didn't do it. There you go. <laughs> John Tiveris, go into room two. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> 